All right, now welcome back to this is chapter seven lecture, and we're going to be looking at the planetary systems in a process that we call comparative planetology. So here's a picture of the Earth. <clears throat> this was viewed by the Voyager spacecraft as it left the solar system in 1989 when it went past Neptune. And so the famous astronomer uh, Carl Sagan who was famous for the show Cosmos on PBS and now is being re-hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson on Fox. Good buddy of mine. You'll see that show on Fox. This is the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan once said. We live on this pale blue dot. So we're going to look at what the solar system looks like and how can we learn by comparing the planets to one another. So this diagram is in your book. We'll skip it for now. We know there are eight major planets. We grew up with nine, but now there are eight with nearly circular orbits. Not quite a circle. Remember we said that with Kepler, nearly circular. There are some dwarf planets like Pluto. They are smaller than the major planets and have some elliptical orbits. The planets all orbit in nearly the same direction and nearly the same plane. So here's a question for you. How does the Earth's sun distance compare with the sun's radius? What do you think? It's about 200 times larger. So we talked about comparative planetology. And this is how we compare the planets. We can learn more about a world like our Earth by studying it in context with other worlds in the solar system. We stay focused on processes common to multiple worlds instead of individual facts specific to a particular world. So we're going to compare Earth to all the other planets and back to Earth. Comparing the planets reveals patterns among them, and those patterns provide insights that help us understand our very own planet. So what are the major features of the Sun and the planets? Here they are to scale. The sun's quite large. The sun takes up 99% of the mass in the solar system. And you can see that the largest planet is Jupiter. So planets are very tiny compared to the distances between them. As you can see here in this diagram, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all pretty close to the sun. But then you get further out, and they do go quite a distance away. So let's look at the sun. Again, it's over 99.9% .9 of the solar system's mass. And the sun is made mostly of hydrogen and helium gas as a plasma. It means it's very hot. Here's a picture of the Earth as compared to a solar flare. You can see the solar flare would just eat up the entire Earth. This star, our sun is a star, does convert 4 million tons of mass into energy every second. That's a lot of energy production. Next up is Mercury, made of metal and rock, and it has a large iron core, very desolate, very cratered, long, tall, steep cliffs called scarps. It's very hot and very cold because it has no atmosphere to it. So on the daylight side, it can be 425 degrees Celsius. On the night side, it gets very cold, minus 170. Next up. Cloudy Venus, nearly identical in size to Earth, but the surface is hidden by clouds. Sometimes Venus is called Earth's sister planet, but it's really extreme. Hellish conditions due to an extreme greenhouse effect. It's really a runaway greenhouse effect. It's even hotter than Mercury, 470 degrees day and night because of the clouds that traps all that carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere, just like we do on Earth. Here is the Earth compared to the Moon, our oasis of life. It's the only surface liquid water in the solar system, and a surprisingly large moon, which we'll talk about later on. Next up, Mars, the most visited planet by robotic spacecraft. Looks almost Earth-like, but don't go without a spacesuit. It does have an atmosphere, 1% carbon dioxide. Uh, we do see dust devils on Mars. Gigantic volcanoes, the largest in the solar system, is on Mars. A huge canyon, also the largest in the solar system. The volcano is called Olympus Mons. The canyon is called uh, Valles Marineris. And there are polar caps. 
Water flowed in the distant past on Mars. We do know that. So could have there been life? Where you know this on the Earth, where there's water, there's life. No matter if it's in a hostile environment, very hot, very acidic, very cold, under Antarctica in a hot spring, where there's water, there's life. Well, a friend of mine, a, f a former intern of mine, actually, is the chief landing officer for landing stuff on Mars. And so we actually have here... Uh, the latest rover on Mars is called Curiosity. Landed in August 2012, it joins Spirit and Opportunity and Pathfinder. Of those, only uh, Opportunity is still running, but they ran for nine and a half years and still going. They were given a lifespan of three months. Pretty good, good return on investment there. As Curiosity started to land on Mars, it was actually taken a photograph of by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a mission I worked on. So my former intern, Lynn, she actually landed the spacecraft on Mars. That's her job. Jupiter, the biggest planet, it's much farther from the sun than the inner planets. And take note of this, the four planets we just talked about, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are all rocky and small planets. They have a surface land on. Here we have gas giants, and so Jupiter does not have a solid surface to walk on. Lots of moons, over 60 moons. It's got some ring systems to it. 300 times more massive than the Earth. And Jupiter is mostly, again, hydrogen and helium. But cold hydrogen and helium, not like the sun. Jupiter's got four very interesting moons. It actually has over 60 moons, but four of them are large. Io, which is shown here, has active volcanoes of sulfur all over it. Europa, possible subsurface icy saltwater ocean and could there be life ganymede it's the largest moon in the solar system and callisto which is a large cratered ice ball and galileo saw these in 1609 with his new telescope and we call them the four galilean moons saturn one of my favorite planets other than mars beautiful to look at it looks fake when you look at it through a telescope giant and gaseous just like jupiter spectacular rings this gap you see in the rings here is called the Cassini division after the astronomer Cassini, who uh, Giovanni Cassini, who discovered that. Many moons, including the moon Titan, which we've actually landed on. And we do have a, a spacecraft at Saturn right now. It's called Cassini. Been there for a number of years taking pictures, such as this one. And we landed a, a spacecraft on Titan. It landed at a muddy beach. Now, the rings look solid, but they're really not. They are made up of countless small chunks of ice and rock, each orbiting like a tiny moon. So the Cassini probe arrived right now almost 10 years ago, July 2004. It was launched in 1997, so it took seven years to get there. Imagine buying a computer in 1995 and you're still using it, but it works great. And that's kind of what we have with Cassini at Saturn. Uranus. Please note how I pronounce that. We don't say Uranus. It's Uranus. And we can all figure out why. Smaller than Jupiter and Saturn, but much larger than the Earth. It's also made up of hydrogen and helium and some compounds. Water vapor, uh, methane. It's got an extreme axis tilt. It's tilted 97 degrees to the perpendicular, and it does have moons and rings on it. Neptune, a very interesting planet, the farthest planet out, similar to Uranus except for the axis tilt, and does have many moons including Triton. Triton is the coldest moon in the solar system. It has active geysers of liquid nitrogen. On Neptune we've discovered in 1989 when Voyager 2 went by that these white wispy clouds there uh, actually are the fastest wind speeds in the solar system 800 miles an hour which is kind of mind-blowing since it's four billion miles away from its heat source the dwarf planets Pluto Eris and more much smaller than the major planets it's icy comet like composition Pluto's main moon Charon is of a similar size so here's Pluto and Charon and this table is in your book all the different facts you want to know about the planets so what process created the elements from which the terrestrial planets were made? Is it the Big Bang, nuclear fusion in stars, chemical processes in interstellar clouds, or their origin is unknown? Cue the Jeopardy music. 
It is nuclear fusion in stars. The universe is made up of hydrogen and helium, and everything else, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones, magnesium, all that stuff comes from nuclear fusion in stars, which is populated in the universe by supernova explosions. So we like to say that we are made up of stardust. What features in our solar system provide clues to how it formed? We can look at the motion of the large bodies as one clue. And we now have discussed that there are two major types of planets. The terrestrial, hard rocky planets, Earth, Venus, Mars, Mercury. And the Jovian planets, which is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The terrestrials are small and rocky. The Jovians are large and gaseous. The terrestrials have very few, if any, moons, and the Jovians have many moons. The terrestrial planets have no rings. The Jovian planets all have rings. And then we have other bodies. Asteroids and icy comets in the solar system. Now there are some exceptions to the norm such as the tilt of Uranus. Here's a picture of uh, something that I actually saw June 6, 2012. This is a transit of Venus, which is when the planet Venus goes in front of the sun and we see it. I actually looked with the solar telescope and my solar glasses and watched this from my front porch of my house. It was really neat. Uh, and you can find pictures of that on my Facebook page somewhere. Well, let's take a look at how we explore the solar system with robots, robotic spacecraft. So we've seen the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Curiosity spacecraft. What, one way we get by with using less fuel is by doing flybys. So this is pretty popular when we try to go out to farther and farther places. Instead of taking lots of fuel on board, it costs $10,000 to launch one pound of anything, whether it's fuel or what, parts or an antenna. So we try to use what we call a gravitational assist. And that's when we swing the spacecraft by a planet, and the gravity of that planet speeds it up and slingshots it back out into space. So we have orbiters, and they go into orbit around another planet or another world. More time to gather data, but cannot obtain detailed information about the surface. And then we have probes or landers that do go on the surface and explore it in detail. And then there are sample return missions. They land on another world, gather samples, and the spacecraft is designed to blast off and return to the Earth. The moon missions called Apollo were an example of this. And we have another one called Hibisa. That was an asteroid mining mission, and we're hoping to get one to Mars soon. Sometimes we can body up two spacecraft together, and the Cassini Huygens mission was part of this. The Cassini mission had a piggyback called Huygens that landed on the moon Titan. And I said it landed on a muddy beach of methane. It's so cold there. And then the Cassini spacecraft keeps going around Saturn, which is pretty neat. Pretty neat that we can send a spacecraft a billion miles away and have a probe land with a parachute on the muddy beach of a moon somewhere. Pretty fascinating. 